While Dantov was devastated, others were being moved into place who would help to keep Corvette racing alive. The most important shift occurred in 1958. Harley Earl retired, and Bill Mitchell took over. Bill Mitchell was the kind of guy that could enter a studio, and it's like he would spread a little bit of gasoline on the floor and ignite it. He really got you excited. Now, if you did it right, he just got more excited. If you did it wrong, he was quick to tell you. Mitchell's early interests in art and automobiles brought him to GM's attention. He thrived under Harley Earl, who responded to Mitchell's dynamic sketches. Someone told me way back I had a, a, an alliance with Rembrandt, so I, I sort of always have been fond of Rembrandt. He hardly did a painting that wasn't dramatic and uh, exciting. For his personal excitement, Mitchell acquired an early Corvette racer. This ensured his interest in the Corvette's fate. Mitchell saw unlimited opportunities for the Corvette now that the Thunderbird had opted to blend in with the rest of Ford's offerings. The Thunderbird was always some other kind of a car. Even when it had two seats, it was never a sports car. It was just a big old comfortable Ford with two seats. And uh, the, uh, the Corvette aspired to be a sports car from the beginning. They just got it wrong with the first couple of years. Mitchell desperately wanted to fix the Corvette. He believed that having a high-performance sports car was important. But when Mitchell assumed control, racing was still a dirty word. Chevrolet was busy selling the safety and durability of its full-size lineup. Thrilling proof of the durability safety, handling ease, and all-around performance that are built into every 1958 Chevrolet. Well, you'll excuse me if I sound a little prejudiced, but, uh, but after that, what a car. Will you ask your Chevrolet salesman to demonstrate its many, many features to you and your family? Many powerful people at GM were opposed to high performance and speed. Mitchell thought it was a natural human urge. I think when the light changes, you want to go. You want the car to, to turn and handle the way you like to have it handled. Undaunted, Mitchell made a bold move that assured the Corvette's future. He knew that what was left of the Corvette racing effort was stored at GM's tech center. Bill Mitchell actually had uh, purchased the, the Stingray, uh, or it actually was the Corvette SS uh, mule chassis that uh, Zora had put together for the Sebring race. And it had been the, the test mule that uh, everybody had driven. And they had no use for it because uh, they, they quit the racing program. So Bill Mitchell purchased it from Chevrolet for, I believe, the sum of $1. Time spent on the racing circuit convinced him that he could develop the car and set up a racing team. He sketched on the back of an envelope uh, kind of a one main, main line with a little sweep to it and with these bumps for the wheels. He says, no, I want a mean looking car, something like this, but uh, you, you make it slick. This 1959 car borrowed many elements from the Corvette SS, but took on its own identity. Mitchell's love of deep sea fishing gave this race car its name, the Stingray. We stretched the wheel shapes out a little bit longer. We cleaned up the headrest slightly, and uh, we're off and running. Uh, that became the Stingray Sports Race Car. The car had a name, but it needed a driver who would meet the Sports Car Club of America's amateur requirements and give General Motors' involvement plausible deniability. A dentist who'd raced Corvettes for years, Dick Thompson, agreed to come on board. By April of 1959, Thompson and the redesigned car were ready to go. Without delay, they took the car to a race in Marlboro, Maryland. Mitchell was confident he had a winner. Zora had the right guts under her. And uh, to me, 
when they raced out at Sebring and, and Fanjo and Moss and they drove it, they, they, they came right out and said, this is a hell of a car. As usual, the first outing was a bit rough. The Stingray's brakes locked up and the inverted airfoil design literally lifted the front wheels off the ground. Over the next several months, they worked on the problems as they continued their racing efforts. In 1960, they repainted it to the silver color, and they made a whole new body, which was very, very lightweight. And then the car became a lot more successful. They fixed the brakes, and uh, Dick Thompson was driving it on a steady basis, and he was a very good driver. After several more outings, the car had become a fine racing machine. Because of the official racing ban, General Motors still kept its distance. But the Stingray began to win. The next year, it won the SCCA C production title by a wide margin. However, the Stingray's biggest influence wasn't on the racetrack. It was on the next production Corvettes.